Good morning. Welcome to Books at the Bottom of the Stairs. My name's Loreen. Welcome back. If you have been here before, I'm glad to see you. I have two books that I'm you know, interested in sharing today, and they are very different. Now, they're both short books, so for those of you who are looking for recommendations for, uh, is it Shorty September? I think both of these books would qualify. Um, this one's uh, first book I'm going to talk about is called Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan and it is 118 pages and uh, the other one Echo on the Bay by Matsatsugo Ono is um, 140 pages both very quick reads so these books were both fascinating in completely opposite ways and in, in, in good ways compared to the previous two that I was discussing um, first of all, I thought the stories were a lot more um, coherent and they're not they're, they're both fiction. Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan is uh, an amazingly economic language experience. Uh, this author is so economical, but it's still so uh, amazingly potent. Um, she, without saying too much, I don't know, how do you say that? It's just like, it's not economic to the point of being, you know, instructions on the back of a barbecue. It's just that she can see, um, she can, you can see the picture that she's painting of a small town in Ireland, and there's a, a nunnery up the road convent, and there is a school attached to it that the sisters run, and that's for the uh, village children, and then there is um, behind the tall walls with a glass and iron bars is a school, a Magdalene school, which if you don't know, is a place where young girls, unmarried women, would go to have their babies. And they could be put there by family members. The police could put them there if they were sort of a problematic woman. Um, a husband, husband could put your, his wife there if uh, she he didn't think that it was his baby. And basically these women have the babies behind these spots. They are forced into the labor of doing the laundry and um, their babies are born and ultimately given away, sold away. I don't know, the records are pretty, uh, they're pretty iffy, I think, and uh, there are other books that are out there. Um, Philomena is a movie on this topic, which was with Judy Dench. Oh, that was a really interesting movie. And then there's, um, oh my goodness, The Fountains, is it The Fountains of September, I want to say, by by Ruta Septis. I'll, I'll put the proper information in below, but uh, it's a similar type of story that's taking place in Spain. Um, post World War II. But this one's taking place in Ireland and it's a young man, uh, not a young man, he's he's sort of a middle-aged gentleman and he is going on his route. He has he's a coal merchant and he has a stations where he has to drop the coal off and he's managing this coal business and um, he's brought himself up from virtually nothing although he as an orphan child himself had the um, the good luck to uh, stay with his mom and the lady that his mom worked for uh, was generous and kind and made sure that he had some of, of a few little extras he never really went hungry or poor so so he's starting off in a better place than a lot of orphans would and so he's eventually married and become um I, well, one of the things we weren't sure of was whether he actually owned the coal company or whether he was the manager but anyhow he just was in charge of everything and on his route he goes past this convent and he goes to put the coal into the uh, like there's a door where the, the coal gets loaded down into for the sisters and he discovers something and I, ad I don't want to give it away it's it's fairly yeah I don't want to give it away and he has a total crisis of conscience and so this book is um, uh, I was reading it because I had just been reading uh, two or three books that that were on a faith path thing 
and the storyline takes place close to Christmas. I was reading it as a little bit of the story of Jesus and Mary, I'm sorry, not Jesus and Mary, uh, Joseph and Mary coming to the inn. And so we see Bill kind of doing this journey. He's got these unwed mums on his mind. He's got the whole convent thing on his mind. He's got the whole thing about, you know, what am I doing with my life? It's, it's an amazingly good life compared to what I had expectations for. I have, I have exceeded expectations. He's reflecting back on his um, situation with his mom, who was an unwed mom. Um, he's reflecting back on the lady who looked after him and his mom and her kindnesses. And, um, you know, a little bit about his dad. And um, then he comes back to the convent. And um, he has a discussion with Mother Superior. And things are definitely going Mother Superior's way as they do. <laughs> I don't think there are very many mother superiors watching, so maybe I can be a little bit snide. Um, I think that mother superior is definitely a power broker in the community, as is the convent. I mean, they're a significant customer of the coal merchant. So he's got all these things on his mind, as well as his own family, what their place is in society, what his wife's comments have been. And we find him making a choice that is contrary to his personal interests. And um, so, I mean, that's that's something that's said on the blurb. I'm not giving anything away by saying that he confronts something that he has to really make a decision about. And someone else was reading it uh, in the book. This was a book club book. And we just finished it last night. And someone else was reading it in terms of it's the, the small little, little things that people do that keep the world a humane place to live, that we can't always tackle what it is uh, on the grander scheme, but we can work with what we've got right around us. And what that means in terms of stepping into the oncoming traffic and trying to go against you know, the flow of what is, what is uh, the perceived right things to do, it definitely gives us an idea into how the morals of one time in society can be quite different than ours. I mean, this, this story is taking place in the um, 1985, which it really isn't that long ago. Uh, but I think that the group that was reading it definitely had a completely different moral compass than the, the village that uh, Bill lives in. So this is just a wonderful book. It's, it is um, written at uh, the time frame of Christmas, but I wouldn't call it a, you know, a happy-go-lucky Christmas story. Although, because it is about hope and it is about redemption and so on, it, it's, it kind of fits the theme of, of what, you know, what's nice to read at Christmas. Um, now, Claire Keegan, I believe, is a poet and she has written Walk of the Blue Fields. I'm sure she's written other things. I believe that she is, is quite prolific. She also wrote uh, Antarctica. So I'm going to follow her through. She's just, her her writing is so, I don't know, I just really don't know how to describe it. It's it's fluid, it's linear, it has um, a cohesion to it because she doesn't go off um, in her sentence structure and paragraph structure. She just, she she stays to the line that she's, she's drawing about the characters and the action and so forth. So there's not a lot of meandering through description. Um, but yeah, it's just a really beautiful, beautiful read. I would say that I read this in an afternoon easily. It was really a compelling read. Top drawer. Now this other book, I'm actually on my second time reading it through. I did talk about it once very briefly before. Echo on the Bay by Masutsugo Ono. And he is also uh, Japanese and he is also um, a well-known author in Japan. Uh, now translated by Angus Turville. This is one of those stories that is actually not very complicated, but do you ever get into those situations where someone knows all the details and instead of just saying, oh, he bought the Chrysler from Andrew, 
they'll say, well, the Chrysler was originally at such and such a shop and uh, it was first owned by Mr. Smith and Mr. Smith gave it to his son who, um, you know, gave it to his girlfriend and his girlfriend sold it to her brother. And, you know, before you know it, you finally, you know, the mileage and the tires and, and the backstory of the brother who actually broke his arm while going to a baseball game in the Chrysler, like, you know, that kind of a storyteller. That's this kind of a story in that it's a, it's a very simple story that's being told. The question is why, um, well, there's a boat that has appeared in the harbor. That is the returning of a boat that left the harbor many years earlier under mysterious circumstances, but it's empty. There's a question about there's supposed to be a body in the beach, on the beach, but nobody can find it. And only the, the drunkest person in the village has seen this body. So what's that all about? Then there is uh, the harbor itself is being polluted by um, uh, uh, the food that they use to feed the fill the yellowfish. Is it tuna? Is it yellowfish tuna? Anyhow, um, the the harbor is polluted, so they decide to dredge the harbor, and so that has a whole bunch of ramifications on both the fishing industry that's in the harbor, the construction company that's the other main employer, and the harbor itself and the people. And all of this is being told, um, there are other side stories, part of it, and this is being told by four guys who are standing on a corner and uh, the local police officer who's come in from one of the bigger cities and he's brought his young family. And the narrator is his daughter, the policeman's daughter, who's having an affair with her social, se social science teacher. And I, you know, like that brought to me a, like a secondary question is, um, here in Canada, we have got certain age limits as to when you can have intercourse with um, young people. And I don't know her age, but, I'm, but she's still in school. And so I'm thinking, I wonder if they have the same laws. Like, is this okay? So I don't know the answer to that. She doesn't seem to, she doesn't seem to be in any kind of fear with, about being caught. Um, okay, so it's it's this story that just it does these little ellipses and they intersect on each other and it's kind of like Venn diagrams or spirograph, maybe spirograph is more the correct word. And so we keep coming back to some stories and leaving them and, and then eventually coming back around to a story. It's just the most amazing loop-de-loop -loop I have ever read. And the first time through, the only thing that, that threw me off were the names. Uh, you've got a person's birth name then they get their childhood nickname, and then you will get their adult name, and then if they're female, their name will change. But of course, in Japan, we get the last name first and the first name last. But then there are all these little, um, uh, uh, su which comes first, a prefix or a suffix? Prefix comes first, suffix comes second. So like uh, affectionate terms, so uh, the N-I would be one kind of a suffix, and then S-H-I might be another kind of a suffix, and J-I would be another, and they all connotate um, an age or a level of respect or a position in the family, for instance. So everybody's name morphs over the course of the story. I found that difficult, so the only thing I would recommend is that I did do, I did do a character list, despite it being an extreme incredibly short story, but uh, I just found I had to because the first time through I wasn't a hundred percent who was who was on uh, like whose story we were reading at the time. So that's too yeah, that's too bad. You know, for a short story if you have to do that, I think that's a bit of a shame. To me it's a deterrent. So if you're listening to me saying that and you're going, well I'm not gonna do that, it's actually worth it. I, it's actually such a good strong story and it's in certain parts, it's really comedic, and I, I mean, the four guys who are um, telling the story on the street corner are just such goober heads. <laughs> so, like, they're just goofs. They're total goofs. But um, the other ones are quite tragic. There's some really compelling characters in here, and uh, the whole story of how the village interacts with itself, and it's a modern-day story. Um, I, if I knew anything about cars, I'd be able to tell you what time this took place, because... Uh, there's different kinds of Toyotas and Chryslers and so forth that uh, tell the tell the time scale instead of 
instead of uh, other reference points. Uh, are there cell phones? No, I don't think there are cell phones. Anyhow, um, it's really interesting. And I would say that this is an author that you would probably um, like to continue with. The Water Covered Grave was a winner. And I think he's done some other things as well. Uh, so also very, very much strongly recommend. So two short books, um, both really worth your while. And I think that's it for me this week. Last week was a bit long. And today has been kind of a long day. I'm a little bit tired. We had snow over the course of last night. I haven't shoveled an inch, but you know, I have been looking at it. It has been tiring me out. Steve did the shoveling and I watched and that tired me out. So I think I'm gonna go make a little tea and have a rest because yeah, it's, I'm exhausted. <laughs> so I hope all your reading dreams and adventures continue to come true. And I, oh, you know what? I won't see you next week. I'm going on a little vacation. Cheryl, who you've sometimes seen, has invited me up to her cottage. We're gonna go for four days. We're taking lots of books and some knitting and some patterns to cut out for sewing and uh, yeah, a couple of other couple of other things. So I'm gonna give myself a break. You guys can take a break too. I know you're just as tired of, of listening to me as I ramble on, so you get to go and have a little toes up next week. And then, I hope all your reading dreams and adventures continue to come true. I'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye for now.